life. It's all around us. If you ever go outside, then it's going to be there too. Probably. But now you can avoid doing that and simulate it at home on your very own computer. So hey, welcome back to the Evolution Simulator Project. Uh, not the final name, but I haven't chosen a better one yet. And if you're new and don't know what the hell is happening, then let me give you a very quick recap. Here's a creature. Let's call him Bob. Bob will one day die, but he can prolong the inevitable by gaining energy. And he can do that by eating these little green pellets. But here's another problem. Bob is also not alone, and everyone else also wants those pellets just like him. So Bob has to evolve to be stronger and smarter than everyone else. Well, he can't actually evolve, but he can lay eggs that then hatch into children that are slightly mutated or look and act different. And eventually, if you repeat this, his lineage will evolve into hopefully something better. Their bodies can change to be the best, and their AI minds are powered by a neural network that can think of new ways to be better. All this so that Bob and his children become the ultimate species. Well, it's a little less dramatic than that, but now you're caught up, so let's get on with the content. So this project has been going on for a little while now, and I believe that it's time that I finally open it up and get people to start using it. But I need to fix some things first. The UI is one of the worst things I have ever seen. It looks ugly, it's annoying to use and it can't really do much. Like come on, look at this, it looks like someone went on MS Paint and fell asleep halfway through making it. The font looks out of place and way too oversized. It says so much but none of it's important. And the text boxes, don't get me started on those. I want to try and make something that's first of all better, but also something that you don't really see a lot. Now the problem with most UIs is that they can either be way too simple and you need to flick through 50 different menus and enter some secret keyboard shortcuts to do anything just because that is somehow more minimal, or it's way too complicated and every single option is just shown to you no matter if you actually need it. And I took this idea from a game called Project Zomboid, uh, aside from it being a pretty good game, the UI is actually pretty interesting as the menus can be either as complicated or as simple as you want, so at least the layout can. There are icons on the side that you can click which then bring up their corresponding menu, but then you can also drag it around and place it where you want, so, and you can bring up as many menus as you want, you aren't just limited by only seeing one thing at a time or overwhelmed by everything but instead you can just focus on what's important in that moment, and you can change into something better when you need to. I really like this idea, so I'm just going to take it. Okay, let's begin with the coding. Here's how everything looks right now, uh, just to give you a reference on how everything's going to change. Okay, step one made the menus much cleaner and nicer looking. I don't know about you, but I kind of like this Windows 95, 98 style, and I'll probably keep it, well, unless I find something better. Also makes my life a lot easier as I don't need to come up with an original design. And here is the title bar. It just lists out every single menu and you can click on it to toggle that particular menu on and off. So now you can just rearrange the UI to be how you want it, just like I was talking about earlier. But right now I don't have that many different menus. That's better, okay, I should probably explain all these. The quit menu, pretty self-explanatory. It just closes the program, you know, it's pretty boring. Sim info, almost equally boring unless you really like numbers because that's all it is. Just some statistics on how much stuff there is. And also the FPS and current frame, but that's because I didn't really know where else to put it. Sim menu is where you start and stop the simulation, along with tweaking some starting parameters. Before this I had to close and reopen the program every time I wanted to restart the simulation. And I had to go into the code every time I wanted to change how the simulation ran. So this is an improvement. Next is the left menu, a weird name, but it's the menu that controls what left click does. I should probably make a right menu too, but I'll do that later. The first two buttons toggle spawning in food and meat, and you can also exploit the physics engine just to fling stuff at creatures at very high speeds. It doesn't damage them and they don't feel pain, so ethically that's probably okay. Select just, well, selects a creature that you're clicking. Some other menus use it. To, and it also shows which food, meat, pellet, or creature is closest to that specific creature. Kill, well, kills, and god help any poor creature that slighted you in any way. The next four, I don't know why you might use it, I kind of just wanted to add it to see if it worked. It's for force pushing and pulling various things. The first three buttons control what it affects, and you can input how strong it will be, 
making it negative or positive just changes it from a force push or pull. It's pretty fun though, as you could just watch everything fly around and the physics engine try its best to handle it. Must be pretty weird from the creature's perspective, as for no reason, everything just gets flung around. Good thing these creatures are pretty stupid, as maybe they begin to realise they're in a simulation. Maybe they try and rationalise it with some complex formulas and make up some laws on how the universe works. Then there is the send to button, which just teleports whichever creature is selected to your cursor. Sim rules, this one just lets you tweak some of the simulation settings as the simulation runs. If you don't understand what the labels mean, that is because they are really shortened down versions that I didn't change after I switched the font to a smaller one. I should really fix that. The next three I could just do all at once, as they used to be one big menu, but I just broke up into lots of smaller ones, as you didn't really need to see everything at once. Creature Networks just shows the selected creature's neural network uh, in this ring shape, as it was very easy to code. I'm lazy, okay. Creature Vectors just gives its position, speed, and acceleration. Creature Misc just tells you some things about the creature that didn't really deserve their own menu. It's speed, size, sight, how good it's digesting, but that one's pretty important, and some other things. Debug Log, uh, well that one's actually pretty useless to you. That's mostly there just for when I'm coding and I need some way to see some certain bits of information. I might make in future so you can put in commands, but you can just ignore that for now. Okay, fix it up a little, made it more presentable, but there is a problem. It only supports Linux and not Windows. Imagine this box as the project. It is made of lots of different parts, but it can be broken down into a couple key ones. The simulation code, graphics code, AI code, and physics code. Now the simulation code doesn't care what OS it's on, and it'll work just no matter what. Same goes for the AI and physics code, as it's all just a lot of maths. No reason for it to be OS dependent. But the graphics. Oh, the graphics. That box can be split into two more boxes, the OpenGL and the window encoder. OpenGL handles all the cool flashy graphics that you see inside a window, and it's what everyone else mostly talks about. Now the OpenGL part is smart, if you use it on Windows, it will use the code that works on Windows, and on Linux, it will use the Linux specific code. Very nice, no extra work needed for me. The window encode, on the other hand, is the problem. All the window encode manages is the actual window itself, creating it, destroying it, title name, that sort of stuff, and the inputs to it, keyboard and mouse for example. That code is very dependent on the OS you're on. And to make it even better, it's completely different depending on what OS you're on. On Linux you have the X11 display server. Yes, I know that's an oversimplification, I don't care. Uh, to control and manage the program window. And you use something called xlib to send commands to the x11 display server. And all my code is written to use xlib. On Windows it's different and has the desktop window manager, which is sort of like x11, but also not. And instead use the Win32 API to interact with it. My code does not work at all with the Win32 API because it doesn't even use it. So now I have to make this cross-platform. I wouldn't need to if I just used someone else's graphics library, but no, I had to make it all custom. But it shouldn't be that hard, right? I just need to replace some code, like how bad can it be? Okay, this worked, let's scale it up. Oh, come on, why does Windows have to be so awful to code in? Don't you just love dependency errors for libraries you didn't even know existed? Like, why do I need you? Why did you stop working? Where is the window? Where did it fucking go? Finally. It's over. It works. I'm not going to get into why this was so painful to do as trying to explain how annoying it is to make your code work on two completely different operating systems, but have it so you can still interact with it the same way it would make for a really boring video, but I'll say that it would just take way longer than it should have. I really am just living the sunk cost fallacy. Put so much effort into doing it the hard way that I just have to keep doing it that way. I'm going to have to rewrite the graphics library, aren't I? Just bad design choice after bad design choice. 
didn't even use Win32 at the end, I used GLFW. I'm going to try and remove that, make it pure Win32 one day. And later I went ahead and thought, okay, well, at least go and see if this works on other computers. So I went and asked my Discord server, shameless plug I know, but link to it in the description. So that led me into bug hunting and fixing, and it was painful. First of all, it didn't even start running. Okay, simple enough, I just forgot to include some files. Then there was another bug. When I started the simulation, it would run for a few seconds and then crash. Okay, great. Uh, uh, let's try and get address sanitize up and running. It's one of the few things that makes C++ programming even bearable. Oh, what do you mean that you can't find it? Uh, okay, that's bad, but okay, I, I can still do this. When in doubt, debug it out. So I went and opened the debugger and it showed me what line of code it crashed on, which made even less sense to me as it pointed me to a line that should normally run perfectly, which meant I had a memory error. Okay, let me explain. So this project is made in a language called C++ and without getting too deep into it, I will tell you it is something called a memory unsafe language. Does it mean if you use it someone will come over and break your knees? No, but it does feel like that sometimes. And sometimes, because of this unsafety, you can get some very annoying bugs. Like the one I'm trying to fix, for example. After I found out that this bug will be near impossible to find as it can be anywhere in the code, as I do not program in a safe way, I nearly gave up. But then, I, for once in my life, had a thought, a way to get address sanitizer working. Well, you probably don't know what that is too. Uh, address sanitizer lets me find bugs caused by C++ being memory unsafe very easily, and without it, I would have left C++ for, I don't know, maybe Rust? Yeah, right, like that would never happen. C++ is also a compiled language, which means that when you have your code, you give it to a program called a compiler which then turns your code into a program that your computer can actually run. Now, C++ has many different compilers, which I won't get into, but all I will say is that I changed compilers to another one that actually had address sanitizer, and it worked. I enabled it and very quickly found the bug, which was a bug that I had already fixed a while ago. I manage my code using something called Git. It's very useful and one of its features is that it can be used to have your code uploaded and stored somewhere online very easily. And in this case, GitHub. So here's my code on my PC here, I make a change and then I can just tell Git to push that change to the online version and they are synced and the code there is the same as there, all backed up. And I can go and reverse and download the code from the online version. But this is what happened in my case. A while ago, I found the same bug, I fixed it, but I forgot to push it to the online version. So when I then pulled all that code back down to make the Windows port, I got the version that was not fixed and still had the bug. And by then I already forgot about that. So I put all that effort in for nothing. I sure do love programming. On with the pain now. Here, here are some other nice bugs. Pressing enter froze everything. Food stopped spawning in. Backspace and enter typed absolutely nothing. Everything couldn't stop typing. Another memory bug, much easier to fix though, as I already had everything set up. The menus would open themselves when the program started. You can type in multiple text boxes at once. Everything kept dying. A bug where my code got stuck in a recursive loop, giving me a stack overflow error. But then, to cap it all off, I got a bug that was different. All those other ones were simple, oh no, I forgot about that bug. So, but this one was a different breed. The exact same code I checked on Linux, when I put through the compiler, had the final program run flawlessly. But on Windows, when it compiled and turned into a program, it would run perfectly for a couple minutes and then crash. The same code. This wasn't a case of my mind just failing to do basic things. No, it was the exact same. So I then opened Task Manager to see if that tells me anything and I noticed, oh, the RAM usage is slowly growing and not stopping. Now this is caused by C++ and my usage of it being, as I said, unsafe. 
This kind of bug happens when you ask your OS to give you a chunk of RAM space so that you can then store data in, which you sometimes have to explicitly ask for, but you then after have to then specifically tell it that you don't need it anymore when you don't, so that it can reuse that space for another program. So if you repeatedly ask for space and don't tell it that you don't need it anymore, then oh no, you ran out of RAM, which I don't think I need to explain why that's bad. And I wondered for a very long time what could be causing this as I thought the code was working fine before, so what was the problem now? And I don't know what I did, I, I changed compilers, some options, didn't touch the code, and it was fixed. I don't even care why anymore, I'm just glad that's all over. After all that I got it working perfectly, I think, on Windows, though I'm pretty sad over the fact that I had to make it so the cursor icon doesn't grab when you move the camera around for compatibility reasons. So now poses the big question of what now? As I want to clarify what I will most likely work on in this project. I know I said this in the last video on this project, but in the next video I'm going to try and make their brains much better. Uh, the whole neat algorithm they're based on isn't that powerful and only really shines when there are lots of creatures in carefully controlled and repeatable environments. So instead I'm just going to use a reinforcement learning algorithm, which would actually be more realistic as with neat creatures can only learn, if you can even call it that, when they have offspring, as that's when their brains change. But with a reinforcement one, they can actually learn from doing things, as their brains will change at the moment in response to events that happen. Though I think of maybe going for a more hybrid approach, where both algorithms are used. I don't know, I'll figure it out when I actually make it. There are of course other things I'll work on, but that's the next main goal. As from that, creatures will actually be able to achieve a lot more. And I also haven't really seen an evolution simulator that uses a reinforcement algorithm. There probably are, but I just haven't seen one personally, so it would help make this project more unique and make it more than just a Bibbit's clone. It should also help with predation, as it is technically a feature, but one that doesn't really work well, though my implementation is not a good one. You've reached the end, congrats! and. I just want to say that originally this video was supposed to be a 500 subscriber special, if you could even call it that, as that's where I thought I would be by the end of the month, and I'm a little late for that deadline, but I hit 1000 subscribers instead. Wow, this channel has grown quickly considering it's not even a year old. What now? Oh yeah, the Discord server, you should join it. I put some stuff there sometimes, like how the projects are going, and also the install instructions for this project are on there too. I will try and maybe use the Discord for a future project, so if you want to be in a later video, come join. Though there is also some interesting stuff on there, like one of my members is also trying to create an evolution simulator, so you can see how that project grows and changes. So like, comment, subscribe to make the algorithm like me so this channel can grow more, and see you in the next video.